Hi everybody, Dr. Friedman here with a special bonus content. Uh, as I mentioned in some previous campaign diaries, when we've had our virtual visits, they have been recorded because we're in a pandemic and we don't always know whether students will be able to attend in person and synchronously. What I've given to each of the speakers is the guarantee that unless they would like otherwise, those conversations would be just as private as if they came into our classroom and had a candid conversation with our students. This has been incredibly important in terms of building trust, getting some interesting conversation going that you can't get from other more industry focused kinds of interviews. I think that's really valuable. One exception has been B. Dave Walters, who is extraordinarily generous and of the mindset of thinking his personal and uh, public personas are not that different from one another. And so he has very kindly allowed us to release the uh, scope of his conversation with me and my students. We would have released that a little bit earlier, um, except for we were noodling around with the possibilities of editing the video uh, for student privacy. The challenge is every time I speak, because my voice is getting picked up by the microphones that are throughout our classroom, the Zoom recording cuts to a shot of the entire classroom. So that's problematic. So what you're gonna see is a largely unedited recording of our conversation, but with no video. Um, we, I will have layered in some uh, useful reference images uh, where that's appropriate, but by and large, this is basically a podcast on YouTube. It's the best we could do given that unlike many folks, this is not my primary job. Uh, it's not even, teaching isn't even my primary job, but that's a quick discussion for a different day. Simply, in order to get this out uh, in a timely manner, we couldn't do all of the quick cuts that are necessary um, for um, ensuring student privacy. That said, it seemed particularly important to release this conversation now, as there's a lot of discourse around and questions around how do streamers make money? What are actual play participants doing? Like, how, what are their careers like? Um, and how did, how did the first, this first generation of actual play performers come into the work? And also what's likely on the horizon ahead? And because B. Dave has been very candid, both in Twitter and in this conversation about his working life, I think it's an incredibly valuable resource. So this is a long conversation um, but uh, hopefully a really useful one. Thanks for watching. And thank you again to B-Dave. You are a genuine treasure, um, both to the larger role-playing community and to the community of my course. They are still invoking your name weeks later, along with um, many of our other guests. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And now, without further ado, our class conversation with Mr. B-Dave Walters. Hello. And there it is. That's my La Sombra face. <laughs> you know? Welcome to Auburn. Welcome to Alabama. Hello. Thank you for having me. Uh, I'm from Arkansas, so I've spent a lot of time in Alabama. Yeah, and I uh, know you're a Morehouse man. So Indeed I am. Indeed so I am. What, yeah, so, uh, you know, we're so glad to, to have an English major from the South to talk about this trajectory with us. And dreams do come true. I don't know what to tell you. Yeah, although I just <laughs> do have to say one thing here, Dr. Friedman. Let me, just, let me just get that out of the way. So let me just say that real quick, and then I'm going to go ahead and slide that back over there. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I appreciate the venture showing. Always. Um, so yeah, so this is, you know, this has been kind of uh, up to this point, kind of 
inside the actor's studio, inside the designer's studio, kind of Q&A sorts of moments. Uh, how's audio working for you? Uh, excellent. Can you all hear me? Yes. Um, I may fiddle a little bit more with our outputs, uh, but how are audio levels working for folks? Great. Can, can, oh, but they can, they can hear me, but they can't see me. Yes, and we can see you. Oh, you can't see me? Yes, we can see you. Mm, okay, groovy. <laughs> right. Nice. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to pin this one. So you've got the kind of, dim there are literally five of you in this room right now. So. <laughs> Unlimited power. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> right. so, uh, so yeah, so I know that we've got some kind of beginners in the room. We've got some diehards in the room. Um, we've got my nerdy ass, um, just to kind of give you a sense of the room. We've got some members of our tabletop role-playing club here. We've got some experienced DMs who we've been calling our council sages. This class also fulfills a diversity requirement here at Auburn. Um, and so we have about a third of the class are future teachers okay. and a lot of newbies. Excellent. So, uh, uh, so let me just say, so it don't necessarily assume that you all are English majors. You're just taking an English class. Yeah, God bless them, I know. But right, if you right, are an okay. English major, you know, it's always a good thing. Got it, okay. Mm -hmm. um, Got a it. lot of them are, our education majors are double majors with English and English ed. I think that's fair, okay. to say, right? Yeah. Okay, groovy. So, groovy. so yeah, so they've, they've been through this, but we do have some computer scientists, some hard scientists, some easy scientists, the whole thing. Um, Perfect. We've got a whole lot of experience. Um, we talked a lot about D&D because &D you kind of have to with the scholarship. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, you know, just the kind of nature of the way academics talk about uh, role-playing games. We've talked about vampire a little bit, but not a whole lot. Mm -hmm. And a lot of our newbies have been playing with some new experimental systems like Brindlewood mm -hmm. Bay, Good Society, that kind of deal. So we've mm -hmm. got a little bit of everything kind of in the room. But we have a lot of questions about um, DMing, and we have a lot of questions about what it's like to design things and what okay. it's like to think like a writer in these spaces. Perfect. So, um, yeah. Well, yes, I want all the questions. Uh, I guess I would just say that the first thing um, that I would tell you all is in English degree, I mean, first of all, you all are ahead of the game by the fact that you're here studying in college. Um, in, in this day and age, a lot of times people will tell you that you don't need it. And it is true. You can have a successful career without a college degree, but it just opens so many doors. There's so many rooms you just won't even get into unless you have it. And an English degree is an all-purpose um uh, applicator to be able to get into things. I've done so many things. I, you said you've got tech people there. I ran help desk. Yes. I did desk size support uh, for, for things. I write for film and television now. I do game design. Uh, my background was marketing. I've been CE, uh, CMO of marketing companies, uh, CEOs of my own company. Uh, I've been everywhere and I've done it all. And my English degree has served me incredibly well. So you guys have made it this far. Make sure you finish because the sky's the limit. Yeah, no, that's all we I mean. If we could just like bottle that constantly, <laughs> that would be really amazing. Um, but yeah, I mean, what's been amazing to me as I followed your career is that you do have your hands in a lot of different projects kind of all on the go at once. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about what that experience of like prioritizing and juggling is like? I'm going to tell you guys something that if you don't remember anything else I say to you today, this will change your life if you if you can keep track of this. There is only one thing that every single human being on earth is equal in, and that is time. We all have 168 hours in a week. We're not, uh, some of it, we're tall, short, big, small, black, white, rich, poor, but we all got 168 hours. You, me, Warren Buffett, Barack Obama, whoever. And there is time for everything if you manage it right. Maybe not in the course of a day, maybe not even the course of a week, but over a course of a couple of weeks, over a course of a couple of months, you can do absolutely anything if you manage your time properly. Yeah. So what does that look like in a kind of month these days? 
So for me on a week to week basis, currently my life is I have the times that I stream or film. So those are kind of posts that are driven down into the ground that I have to be right here in front of this camera saying words. Then uh, knowing that those times are bl blocked out, I'm like, what is it that I need to accomplish over the course of the week? And I will schedule that out over the course of the week that it's like today I need to do this tomorrow. I need to do that. And then I sprinkle my meetings in around all that. And then I sprinkle in the gym. Uh, I got kids. I got two young kids. So, you know, want to make sure that I, I see them when they come home. So by the time I sort of put those pins in the wall, it's 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 fairly mapped out. You know, the, the weird like red string uh, conspiracy board of, of a week. Um, but don't forget to also allow yourself time to do nothing, to allow yourself time to let your mind rest, to relax and play video games or watch TV that you like. You know, you don't have to just be go, 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 go all the time because your breaks will be so much more fulfilling when you know you've earned them. Because if you're putting something off and you're procrastinating, and let me tell you something, I am an elite level procrastinator, but you can't really relax when you know something is hanging over your head. You, you, it is scientifically proven to be stressful. So get it out of the way and then be able to just truly turn your mind off on occasion. Yeah, we have a, this is a contract graded course where students pick their kind of projects, whatever they want to do, or however they want to do it. And so we've been practicing that kind of big rock, smaller rock, pebble sand sort of thing. But mm -hmm. it's nice to hear that that's a thing that applies in the real world. Y'all, um, let me let me tell you something. The, this the, this week, I, I won't even tell you this week. I will tell you yesterday. I was on for talking about a television series that I was offered, a film distribution deal that I was offered, um, the where we are on a project that actually got shot three years ago, went to the gym, did a charity <laughs> game for Call of Cthulhu, and Which recorded great, a podcast. Oh, oh, thank you. You know, uh, and that was yesterday. You know, like <laughs> just before, I, I just got off a game development call uh, with right before I jumped in here with you guys after this I'm going to the gym and then I'm going back into I'm going to be doing uh, marketing work until the afternoon when I'm going to stream again so that's just a normal day yeah you, and can, you, you can do it all it can't yeah. be done then you've got D&D &D celebration this uh, weekend which I was telling everybody that's part of the kind of optional uh, exploration for this weekend is there's one on introducing to new players B day I think you're running a game Y'all, the game we shot that comes on Sunday at 1 PST is really great. Like, if, if, if you get a chance to watch it, it was called The Dungeon and the Dragon, and they're all monsters on a revenge heist mission. It was really great. So I think it's 3 o'clock your time <laughs> Sunday. If you can, if you can, check it out. If not, watch the VOD. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, the links on Canvas for those of you who want to see the full schedule of stuff, and I've highlighted some of the relevant events uh, mm -hmm. there, so... So yeah, so um, I guess I'll, I'll kind of dial it back from what are you doing right now? And it's kind of, it's fascinating to me, you know, I've been talking to students, uh, you know, because Abria is coming on Thursday and you're here right now. We're all kind of in our own field about the same age. And it's kind of one of those, how did I get here moments? Mm -hmm. so, so, so fill in a little bit of the space between graduating as an English or, you know, finishing an English major and the career you have now, um, how'd you get started? Or how did you, you know, what were the first steps you took after I, you left Moore House? I could not have foreseen that <laughs> I would be doing what I was doing because what I'm doing now didn't exist. Uh, if, right. if, you, if you told me five years ago, much less 10 years ago, that my vocation would be playing D and D and vampire. I would have laughed at you. Like, that's not a thing. What are you talking about? Um, so it's been wild. Um, so fresh out of college, I was working in it when I was in college, um, doing a uh, tech support, fixing computers and things like that. Uh, I was studying martial arts, iron black belts in a couple different disciplines. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I'm gigantic. I'm like six, nine, two seventy. So uh, I um, I ended up yeah I, I ended up uh, becoming a bodyguard for for a rock band. Um, some some friends of mine um, were in the early two thousands uh, formed the band Evanescence, and I'd grown up with them. Wait, what? Yeah. 
Yeah. This is like uh, when I dropped the Beyonce bomb with my students. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Um, <laughs> my, uh, yeah, he, he called and he's like, hey, you got your black belt. Come be head of security for the whole band. And I'm like, no, like nothing qualifies <laughs> me to be responsible for like 50 people's lives. No. And he keeps calling and the deal is better every time. And finally, he's like, come just be my bodyguard. I'll pay you double what you're making and I'll pay it all in advance. I'm like, okay, if you're gonna like violate my civil rights, I guess, okay, you know? So that, uh, that was, went all over the place with him. Uh, you know, we're, we're all adults here. Uh, sex, drugs, and rock and roll, that life is absolutely bananas. It is absolutely what you think. I don't know if it's because like film and TV is trying to keep up with rock stars or they just watch so many movies. They're like, this is what it's supposed to be like. That's what it's actually like. And uh, that was how I came out here to LA. And my, my, my ambition was to write, because I've always been a writer. I, I wrote my first comic book when I was five. Um, I had no interest. Published, in, yeah, hmm? I mean, you published comic books. You I know. do. It's, You've uh, you got Ian from the Dark and Wish. You found, yeah. say, I don't know how heavily I'm cropped, but that's my girl is still my desktop over there. No, um, no, you're, you're a shot. So, um, and uh, yeah, so I came out here, I had no intention to act or perform and I got drawn into doing movies uh, because it was like monster stuff and creature stuff and like stunts because I was a big dude who knew the martial arts and, and I did some acting stuff and I just liked it. It was fun. Um, but uh, it is it is difficult to break in and survive as as a uh, as a writer. So you know, I went into marketing. I actually owned uh, an insurance agency for a long time because my dad had been in the insurance business. And uh, when my oldest daughter was born, I didn't want the um, inconsistency of like living uh, of of a commission only life. So that was when I signed up for a company. Uh, I, I went to work for ABC Mouse. Um, I was one of their first employees in, in their marketing department. And around all of this time, when I, when I was in the insurance business and I was doing financial planning, and I would try and help people figure out what do you want to do when you retire and all that stuff. And I realized people weren't giving themselves permission to admit to themselves what they wanted. It's like, hey, man, if you want a boat, get a boat it's fine it is like ooh, what will the neighbors say the neighbors will say i wish i had a boat like what, what, what are you talking about you know and and i spent so much time trying to help people unpack the blocks and obstacles in their head that i as i was transitioning out of the financial services i transitioned into doing life coaching and doing motivational stuff uh i became a nationally syndicated columnist english degree yo um i had a uh, a talk radio show for about seven years and I, I had a love for this geek culture in around this time is when I first started doing panels. And I talk about things like the spiritual significance of the Avengers or, you know, the symbolically, why do these things resonate with us? Why do we even care so much about this? And um, on the set of the very first movie, I'm sorry, I, I know this is long, but I'm giving you the short version. No, this is great. <laughs> on the set of the very first movie I ever did, uh, I met my buddy Damien Poitier. And I'd introduce him to Jason Charles Miller. And the two of them started doing some stuff at Geek and Sundry, which was mm -hmm. fairly new. Mm -hmm. And I remember on the inside, I was mad hostile about this. I didn't say anything to either of them, but I was like, you guys wouldn't even know each other if not for me. Like, but nobody wants me to come to Geek and Sundry. Like, whatever, that's cool, that's cool, whatever, whatever. I gotta go to work anyway. And uh, Damien calls me up on a Wednesday and he says, I got an idea for a show called Ask Your Black Geek Friend, where we just have, conversations that people don't know who else to ask and i'm like let's do it shot the pilot. he called me wednesday we shot the pilot saturday geek and sundry said they wanted it monday this was in march but march of 2017 but the show didn't go up until august because of just every possible delay under the sun and i knew once i got in there when i set foot in that building i had a plan that i was like i will dominate all of this stuff and the way i was going to do it is i was i will always be on time and prepared. I will always be easy to work with and I will give it my all every single time. And I knew if I become known for those three things, I will never want for gigs. And that has been true. And gigs have just begotten gigs, begotten gigs, you know? And here we are. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, um, I'll show you guys uh, after class, but, and some of you who follow me on Twitter know that I posted a kind of very rough and dirty data visualization I've been working on in terms of people who play actual play in official sponsored D&D &D content. 
and the middle of that scrum, the connection to everybody else is B Dave. Bull Ring uh, Jordan. Indeed, uh, you're you're a major hub in that. Uh, of course, Tanya the Cass is a big uh, hub in that. Um, that you guys are, you know, kind of the beating heart, kind of rivers deltas in many ways. That was really neat to see that data visualized. <laughs> by the way, I was like, oh, word! It's like I'm here with the McElroys. Hey, McElroys. Yeah. I uh, well, you yeah. know, I think you know, I may need you to fact check this at some point. I know you do so much stuff you don't remember, but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> We're sticking you know, with the like D&D live stuff for the moment just because there is so much actual play now. It's it is wild. I go and I look at my IMDb and I read stuff and I'm like, oh yeah, I did do that. <laughs> like it's been it's been a jam-packed four years. It really has. Um yeah. and uh but it, it, but one of the the best things about this is it has given me the opportunity to write my own my own ticket to do the things that I want to do and create the projects that I want to make and tell the stories that I want to tell and not yeah, just ultimately be beholden to someone else. It seems like artistic freedom, even within the realm of capitalism, is still, it still seems like an appeal of a lot of uh, coming into this space. It's, it there's, seems like. Yeah, there's, there's a concept known as a thousand loyal fans, uh, which if any of you were considering becoming a, a creator in any capacity, uh, look up a thousand loyal fans, because you don't actually need hundreds of thousands of people to like what you do for you to be able to have a career you just need about a thousand people that are going to buy whatever you put out and you can build a career off of that and that is not difficult to do yeah it's also known as uh we talk about it in class as the long tail of mm -hmm. culture the idea that you know yeah there's the blockbusters that are put out you know in basically every media but then there's like this long tail really steady production where you yeah the 1000 loyal fans is a another great uh kind of way of thinking about that yep absolutely so, so talk to me about um the distinction between actual play performance and some of the other dming you do i don't know if you do do you do any private dming anymore or is it i mean i know you do for hire like D and in a castle and things like that oh, you mean like home games yeah, like home games, like nobody. Nah. Yeah, no. <laughs> no. So, nah. so okay, so I'm changing my I'm changing my 18th century parallel for my colleagues who are wondering. I'm like, no, no, B. Dave Walters, the Samuel Johnson, only a blockhead DM without money. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you, well, for me, and, 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 and don't get me wrong, I have a lot of friends. I have a lot of friends who are pros that still really love home games because I will tell you what. Here's what the difference between a home game and a, and a stream is. Um, in a home game, it is a social activity. The fact that you all get together, that you have a meal together, that you talk about work, that you complain about your boyfriend, girlfriend, you talk about the Mandalorian, you know, that you connect with people and then you all go on this journey together is what's happening at a home game. In a stream, all of that stuff is trimmed out of it and you were left only with the bare bones of the game and of the performance. Um, to me, there is no difference between the way I play at home and how I play on camera. It, it, it's, it is the exact same me wherever. And because of that, I'm like, we might as well turn on a camera because we're giving this away for free right now. So that's <laughs> why, I, that's why I, I don't do it. Yeah, so, but, uh, but I, got I, got, I got friends to do. I mean, and and I did for a long time. Obviously, I mean, I've been I've been playing these games for thirty years. Literally, before you were born, I was playing Dungeons and Dragons. Back in my day, we had to calculate Thacko by hand. Oh, yeah. don't even. We've already talked about. That. <laughs> my favorite was a student comment that was, "Why would you want to be a female character in an earlier version of D of in advanced D and D? Like you wouldn't. Uh, mechanically, it's a disaster." We've been, you know, we've been talking about the kind of history of representation in earlier versions of the game. Well, the the people that created some of that stuff didn't want girls playing, so it's not. Uh, there's no coincidence that you're like, I don't feel very welcome. They're like, cause you weren't. But that is why now it, things have grown. And and they, although I, I will say there, and that's one of the big things about the, the diversity and inclusion push into this space, which, you know, my, my career exists in no small part of my very vocal criticisms of Chult when Tomb of Annihilation came out from Watsi. Um, 
and that it was just very tone deaf and it was very clear they had not consulted any people of color and i called them out for this and to their eternal credit uh watsi admitted i was right and have worked to change greg tito in particular shout out to my homie but women and people of color have been playing these games since their inception whether or not it was for us we were still there we've always been there so i mean cyber cyberpunk the genre was created by mike pondsmith who's a black guy and very much mm-hmm. still alive yeah yeah i mean our yeah the, the legacy continues for sure mm-hmm. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. so i want to open up the floor because you know i can keep i got questions but uh are there questions that are live in the room at the moment um folks uh that are kind of buzzing in the room I've got a good question coming up in my kind of text thread. Favorite game to recommend? Uh, I'll say uh, either if it's D&D, like a module, but, uh, or another game that you wish you could play more of? Uh, let me just say one thing before I answer your question. It's true. Sure. Uh, what I think I will be the most service of for you guys is if any of you have a thing that you don't, you want to do and you're like, I don't know how I could possibly do this. I feel mm-hmm. in my heart that I want to pursue this thing and I don't know how I mm-hmm. can help you. And my DMs are open on Twitter at B. Dave Walters because I realized even saying out loud in front of the class that you want to become a professional fly fisherman or a ballet dancer or whatever is speaking to your heart might seem embarrassing. Holler at me. I will tell you how to do it. Um, yeah. I now- mean, yeah. It's, you have been, you've been open uh, on DMs, which has been really such a great resource. Also um, on the screen here, I've got the mentee. Um, if you, so if you do feel shy, you can, of course, write. By, by text, but questions that are coming up in the room. Uh, favorite game to recommend? Um, believe it or not, it, usually I don't start with D&D unless a person wants to play D&D. Not usually. The thing that I usually start with is the World of Darkness, Vampire Werewolf, because the World of Darkness is this world. Uh, you know, the Auburn University is there. That building is there. It's like that room, the dorms, the the campus, the campus setup. It's all there. It just so happens monsters are here too. And that I find that is a lower barrier of entry for a lot of people because with D and D, when I sell it to them, I'm like, hey, do you like the Lord of the Rings? Yeah. Who was your favorite character in Lord of the Rings? Legolas. Elven Ranger, got it. Let's go. We're gonna play. You know, and 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 that that is sort of their gateway in. But there is a lot of lore, a lot of terminology around getting your getting your head around things. You know, like water deep and never winter, and you know, ten feet of movement per round and spell slots. That is like, huh? That doesn't work for every kind of person. And that's the that is the brilliance of why different games exist. Uh, not just that different people can enjoy different things, same way you can enjoy a comedy movie or a horror movie or an action movie, whatever your whatever your mood is, but there's people that it's like horror is their jam. Like, I love kung fu movies. Like, I love kung fu movies. So, <laughs> you know, the systems are like genre of film. Uh, some people may sample broadly. Some people, like, truly don't like this, but really do like that. Like, there's uh, something called Tin Candles, which has gotten really popular lately. Well, you know, it's funny that you say that. Tin candles is not my jam. Sitting down no. at the table, sitting down at the table and knowing we're all going to die, I'm like, then what's the point? You know, if you <laughs> wanted to make tin candles work for me, we're all gonna sit down at the table and one of us is going to live. Now that's a game, <laughs> you know. Uh, but but I understand, you know, because because the 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 conceit of tin candles is completely divorced from the concept of winning, divorced from the com- from the conceit of surviving, you can just go in. And I'm like, yeah, but I'd go in anyway. <laughs> so <laughs> not my taste. No, I mean, no. That, I think that's a really, I think that's, that seems like an answer to a question that we've been talking about a lot kind of informally, which is how mechanics play into all of this. Mm-hmm. You know, that different mechanics can tell different kinds of stories you can brute force something into do something it doesn't, but you know, the candle structure of 10 candles and the candles burning down and the burning of components creates a particular kind of atmosphere for sure. Absolutely. Well, you know, it, we're, we're neck deep in creating the system for into the motherlands right now. And you know, the question you have to ask yourself from a game design and development standpoint is what do you want the system to be 
what do you want the system to simulate? What do you want it to accomplish? Like, um, D and D is explicit. You can do what it says you can do. And if it does not say you can do it, you cannot do that thing. I mean, of course the DM can reflavor and allow anything, but it's like, it is this. And if it is not written here, it is not that the storyteller system that vampire is based on is implicit. Uh, it is conceptual. You can try basically anything. It's just about assembling a dice pool and just see. Uh, and then based on the successes, how does that manifest? Um, I prefer more the latter. I prefer to reward creativity. I prefer to uh, reward, um, you know, outside of the box thinking and the rule of cool. Uh, when I played Outbreak Undead, because I did two seasons of a show called We're Live Frontier, which was the first major thing I was a part of, actually. Um, the outbreak system is attempting to simulate real life, like real, real life. Like right now, if a zombie came in the room and you're like, I'm going to jump over the table and roll to the floor and shoot it in the head on the way down. It's like, you're probably not, though. <laughs> I'm like, Statistically speaking, you're probably not. All of that's very difficult to do. Uh, and that's what Outbreak is trying to simulate. And that system is so difficult. I remember when we were when we were working on our characters for season one, I didn't know that Ivan Van Norman was one of the publishers of Outbreak. And so we're learning the game, and I was like, why would anyone play this? Like, wh why would you, like, sit down on a Friday night and be like, this seems like a soul-crushing grind. Sign me up. Um, <laughs> I, I, I will say what I came to understand with the brilliance of that game is it is so easy to die, and it is so hard to survive that when you do survive, it feels good. Like, there is such an endorphin rush of, like, holy crap, we lived uh, that other games don't have. I will give it that. We definitely don't get that in D&D. Uh, not really. Not really. Not, not really. I mean, you can, but not really. You know, like, you, you got to work to put the fear of the Lord in people. Uh, but it can be done. I will tell you, the game that I have found that has the most ingenious system for tension is Dread where you have the Jenga tower. Uh, you, like, couple, couple Gen Cons ago, we did a live um, Dread that still was with Ivan. It was, I was playing Bonnie Gordon, Mark Mir, and they had one of the gigantic Jenga towers, like the kind that are usually at bars, you know? Mm -hmm. And we, uh, what happens so quickly is you start, you're pulling away at the, at the Jenga tower, and the thing you start to become worried about is not, can I make my pull? But is my pull going to leave the next person worse off? That's actually what you become scared of. Not that it's going to fall on me, that it's going to fall on them. And it becomes so nerve wracking so quickly. Like the stakes are so incredibly high. And you're like, it's freaking Jenga. Like what? But it, it tells you. <laughs> Yeah, but yeah, it, the way it turned Jenga into yeah, I mean, because Deacon Sundry filmed a, at least mm -hmm. one of those kinds of Jenga two. fuel threads. Oh, yeah, there was two seasons of Dread. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was. It was. I was uh, astonished at the the amount of tension you could get from that mechanic. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. So we've got some more questions, um, and uh, you know, I know you won't answer anything that's not covered by an NDA, but we'll see how you answer this. Um, how My body's ready. How much huh? money do you need to play in a campaign? How much work do you have to put in outside of stream? Uh, so I just put a thread up last I, week. That, oh, it's linked on Canvas. <laughs> yeah. I was like, I'll tell y'all. Um, <laughs> on, on average, for a major production, it's about two or three hundred dollars an episode, mostly. That that's um, if you're a company with a budget. That is kind of a fair indus industry standard. Uh, I have gotten substantially more than that, rarely, but I have. Uh, what's far more common is a lot less than that, um, up to and including zero at times. Um, but I, I would say if, if you see people on anything that is official and sponsored, they're probably making like between two and three hundred dollars. Yeah. Which isn't which isn't bad money if you think about it. It's about a hundred to one hundred and fifty dollars an hour of work. So I'm kind of like, hey, um, for the DM when I'm DMing, I charge double that rate because the DM is doing three to five times as much work 
uh, there's prep work leading up to it. And it is just a lot more to do at the table than to be a player because you got to keep all the plates spinning and keep everything working. And it is also not uncommon for the DM to do a lot of the production in the current environment, especially here in the pandemic where there's a lot of heads and boxes. Um, when we were in the studio, obviously that wasn't the case in some productions have dedicated producers, but not a lot of them. So, um, a lot of times that also is why you might command more money is because you got to wear more hats. So you're the one kind of making sure that the overlays are aligned and all of those kinds of backend things. Mm -hmm. It varies from project to project, but yes. Hmm? Um, yeah, that's, uh, so how much time are you prepping for a session Let's uh let's use let's use a specific question. Um, mm -hmm. Right now, you're running a Ravenloft campaign, a Black Dice Society. How much time per session are you prepping for that? So, for me personally, I plan out the beginning of an episode really carefully, and then I have an idea where we need to be roughly by the half and roughly where we need to be by the end. Um, I never plan the second half of the episode because the players and the dice will both surprise and betray you. But with Black Dice Society, we've shot the epilogues in advance. So I know what the stinger is going to be at the end of the episode. So I know I need to kind of set the, it's like a post driven into the ground that I'm like, I need to get to this point that is going to make sense that these two people are talking type thing. Um, and those are kind of my guide points. Um, for me, with I I planned out what the entire season arc of Black Dice Society was going to be pretty thoroughly understanding that no plan survives contact with the enemy um and that you know what you thought would take two episodes sometimes takes four what you thought would take five sometimes takes one um so episode per episode about in hour to two hours of planning uh this week is going to be a little more because we're dark for D, D celebration, but we hit our next Patreon goal. So we're going to be recording a bonus episode this week. And in the bonus episodes, I can do absolutely anything. So one of the things I have on my to-do list between today and tomorrow is go through and figure out what exactly I'm going to do. Uh, Cause they have no idea. So uh, I'll be able to, to shock and awe everyone. But yeah. A bit simple answer is an hour, two hours. And, and, and quite frankly, I, for those of you that are DMing, I advise against a ton of preparation because one, most of it is never going to come up. You'll spend six hours drawing out on graph paper uh, your your medieval keep and intricate detail, and they're going to follow a goblin into the woods and never set foot in the place. It's just that is what's going to happen. And two, it it ends up becoming railroady because it becomes too easy to fall in love with your story and not the story that you're creating together. So, I mean, you have an idea of your encounters, have an idea of like your monster stat blocks, but just be ready to be yes and. And I will tell you, my style in particular is, whether it's a, com a comedy show or a horror show or whatever, I look at what the players have done, I look at their actions and their inactions, and I ask myself, what is the worst possible thing that could happen as a result of this? And then I do that thing. <laughs> so, yeah. You're, you're not the first person to say that. You probably won't be the last because it makes for interesting drama, for sure. I'm getting um, water, but I can hear you. No, all good. Um, I guess the another question that has come up is the kind of distinction in terms of the kind of a series like uh, Black Dice Society and these one shots that you do for something like D&D &D Celebration where you may or may not know the whole cast they've never played these uh, characters before you've got to tell an interesting story in an hour and a half to two hours mm -hmm. you're often going to be live um uh, does that change the parameters in different kinds of ways uh sort of um when i actually plan ep um encounters in individual episodes i actually plan them out exactly like i plan out episodic television uh beats and acts um, and I have act breaks in the story uh, with the middle act break usually being where you take the the, the, the break on stream. Uh, two hour streams you usually don't take one three hour streams do. Um, Black Dice Society, we were blessed that we were an ongoing show, which is very rare, um, which is really relaxing because when you know that you've got 10 episodes, it's I mean, to a certain extent, 
constraint does breed a little bit of creativity, but a lot of time constraint is just a headache where you're like, there was so much more I wanted to do. Like uh, we only had two hours for this celebration episode, the dungeon and the dragon. I really wish it would have been three hours. It probably would have been the perfect game at three hours. Cause I, I didn't get to hit everything I wanted to hit. And we had to rush a little bit to, to fit it all in. Cause when people start riffing off of each other and everybody's having a great time, it's hard to like get in and be like, there's a plot point here. There's yeah, things right. that happen. Yeah. 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 You you gotta you gotta let people have a good time. Because if the cast is having a good time, the audience is having a good time. Uh, yeah, because seems, oh, I was just gonna say, it seems like the move that D and the Wizards has made a lot with a lot of these more recent um kind of celebrations, D D lives has been to include total newbies who are have comedic chops in some way, shape, or form. So they're gonna go off the rails real fast. Yep. Yep, yep, yep. And, you know, you, you just got to roll with it and just keep saying yes and, you know. Um, something that, that I try to always be mindful of is this is a long form medium. Asking somebody to commit two or three hours is no small thing. And why I never go over three hours. I mean, I, I know there's people that go four and five hours and I'm like, there's literally no point in that. Like Macbeth doesn't take five hours, okay? Your one shot shouldn't. Um, and so I, I try to be mindful of the fact that if people are going to invest their time, well, and let me tell you this one other thing. In streaming, most people do not consume this content by sitting down and looking at the screen. Most of them are mom watching. They got it on in the background while they're doing something else, or they're listening to it as a podcast while they're, while they're moving around. So there's definitely a visual. I want to be the Yeah. There's definitely a visual component, but it is not the most important thing. But I try to be mindful of the fact that, actually, let me, let me tell you a different story. When Vince McMahon bought WCW in like the, the very early, like late 90s, early 2000s when Vince bought this, I watched an interview with him where somebody said, hey, so you don't have any competition anymore. You won. And he said, yeah, I do. My competition is literally everything else a person could be doing. It's go watching football, going outside, having dinner with their family, reading a book, like any, I have to present something that is worth a person stopping everything else they're doing and paying attention to me. So I, I try to come at that, come at it from that standpoint with the content I create. I never intentionally create a filler episode. I mean, I, I try to have something happen every single time, uh, just out of respect for both the audience and the, the cast time. So how much are you, I mean, it sounds like you are the kind of DM who's thinking a lot about audience and structure, as well as the people around, around you that you're, you know, actually playing with. Um, how does a, a sense of audience play into what you're kind of designing, writing up, performing? Let me tell you the second thing that will change your life if you keep track of this, and I will answer your audience question, especially for those of you that are trying to be in the creative space. If you have no intention in the creative space, I would submit you do, though, because even if you're going to teach, you still have to enthrall a room, you have to enthrall an audience, you still have to communicate ideas and things in an entertaining way, because that's what will make it lodge in people's noodles. The reason why I can do what I do, the reason why I can do film and television and novels and short stories and TTRPGs and things like that is that I understand storytelling structure. You know, there's almost 8 billion people on Earth, and we're all built from the same parts, you know, plus or minus some significant differences, I suppose. But we're all built heart, lungs, bones, skin, nose, eyes, brain. But it combines in nearly infinite um variations so uh, there is a book it is a screenwriting book it is called save the cat i highly recommend everybody read that uh it is the best single book on storytelling ever written it the tone of it is very smarmy and gross because the author blake snyder knew that he was smart and he very much is indulging in the fact that he's smart in the book but the points he's making are correct. Uh, there's obviously more to it. People have been talking about writing for thousands of years. I've taught writing classes, but if I had to just pick one thing, because if you understand the bones of a narrative, if you know how to construct something with a compelling beginning, middle, and end, and where something has to change to surprise and astound and, and bring things to a fulfilling conclusion, you can do literally anything. Now, for the audience, 
<laughs> when when this medium is working properly, and this is streaming in general, TTRPGs in specific, but streaming in general, the audience should feel like they're playing with you, uh, that they have a seat at the table. Uh, even for video game streamers, it's like a, you're sitting next to your friend while they're playing games and you're talking with them. With TTRPGs, they are there. Um, and, you know, the, the, that only works when you have created an environment at the table that a person would want to be a part of. Um, and that, that's what fandom is. You know, uh, fandom is feeling like you belong, like you're a part of this. Um, and, and so, yeah, I, I, I very much am always approaching this from the position of the audience first because the audience literally makes it possible to do what we do. With, you know, with, without, without viewers, there are no streams, you know? Um, that is both as an artist in the sense that, yes, I want to take people on a meaningful journey because life is difficult. Um, life has been incredibly difficult for the last couple of years for a lot of people. And if there's something I can do that helps a person take their mind off their troubles for a while, um, you know, I, I want to do it. That's the function of, of, of storytelling, I think, to make people feel like they're not weird and that they're not alone and that everything ultimately is going to be all right. Um, even though you might tell stories where things are not all right at all, <laughs> that can still be cathartic. But even if the altruism doesn't appeal to you, then just straight up business. If nobody watches your show, you will generate no revenue. You will have no ads, uh, no ads. You will have no sponsors. You won't get to do a thing. And then you'll end up like going back to a job that you hate. So whether you do it for the good of all humans or to be able to be profitable, and there's absolutely no reason you cannot do both, you know, it's uh, something that you should be very mindful of. You know, it was interesting to pair that with the kind of retweeting of yourself you were doing at, I think earlier today, or probably late last night, knowing your your uh, your your rhythms, um, the kind of dangers of the parasocial in this in a streamer space, and mm -hmm. that kind of the the sense of immediacy is something that you want to cultivate, but can go too far. Do you have a sense of where that boundary is, or uh, how do you navigate that part of the the package? I just want to say, I don't want to bust her out, but that girl that just walked in 45 minutes late is my hero. <laughs> Sorry, you know what? Some people have been virtual, some people are- I get it, you know, I get it. We're gonna, we're we're gonna we're gonna man. Man. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's, you hard believe that it's one of my star students, y'all. <laughs> I'm just saying pimp status, pimp status. Um, so, um, uh, yeah, the, the parasocial aspect of it. Um, this is where it's tough because, again, theoretically, as I just said, that feeling of familiarity and kinship ultimately is what we're doing. But there is a line of where you're like, well, but we're not actually friends, which the overwhelming majority of people comprehend. Like uh, at, at Geek and Sundry, there was a bar we used to go to um, called Guild Hall, and it's like a geek bar uh, here in Burbank. And it, you know, kind of quickly became known to the fans that it's like when the show went off the air, in about a half hour or so, pretty much everyone you just been watching were going to be at this place. And so fans would start turning up. And at first, you know, it was kind of festive. It was great, you know, but hey, I love your stuff. No, I love you too, man. You know, oh, you know, I recognize you from chat. You know, you're Razor Mane. Hi, what's up, Razor Mane? Good to see you. Glad you're watching. But what ended up happening is like we had people, there's one dude in particular. I won't bust him out. But like after we'd shoot LA by night, we'd all be sitting and he'd walk up and pull up a chair and sit down with us at the table. And it's like, bro. <laughs> You know, and I, being the former bodyguard, was the one that would shoo him. But I mean, I'd do it politely. I'd just be like, we're going to talk about the show. We don't want you to have any spoilers, you know. And we ended up having to stop going to Guildhall because stuff like that would happen. That people, this, uh, and, and unfortunately, you know, my, my, my female colleagues suffer from this much worse, where people build up in their minds that this relationship is two-way. 
you know, mm -hmm. that, that I have absorbed your content and love it. And by extension, think I love you and therefore you will love me back or do love me. And it's like, well, one, I don't know you, man. And two, you don't actually know me. Uh, I know for me, the me that I put out into the world is me. Like sometimes there might be layers, there might be tears. I might talk more about this or less about this, but for the most part, I am as I appear to be. But I go a lot of people that when, you know, they stream, they have their streaming persona, that it's another acting job, that it's like, it's time. Um, I mean, I don't want to bust out Pokimane. I don't know that. I don't know her, but that was the first name that came to mind, you know, that it's like, it's time to be Pokimane, you know? And then when you're done streaming, be someone else. Um, so it's tough, you know, it, it's just kind of about um, in enforcing some of those uh, boundaries and things as they come up, really. Yeah. And I mean, I would imagine social media makes this all the more fraught. And I think, um, you know, in this time where so much of our interactions are virtual, we're meeting people virtually. Yeah, that can add an extra layer to that. The internet is the closest thing we have to worldwide telepathy. Dear God. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, other questions that are bubbling up from the conversation so far. Yeah, Connor? Uh, I want to know, like, in your take of when, like, a villain or an antagonist is such an integral part to some stories, what is, like, your differing approach to building one for a one-shot as opposed to a longer-running campaign? Well, here's the number one thing to remember about how to create a compelling villain. A villain is a hero of their story. Uh, so from their point of view, everything that they are doing is completely correct and reasonable and rational. They're not just out here, -ha -ha, I'm going to blow up the Statue of Liberty because reasons. Although I will say, and this again is revealing my age, at the beginning of G.I. Joe the movie, there's this huge elaborate action sequence where Cobra is trying to blow up the Statue of Liberty. And it's like, why? Because they're Cobra. Okay. <laughs> You know, like sure. acceptable. Uh, the, the difference between a one shot and a ongoing campaign is you can slow boat the villainy in an ongoing campaign. They can appear like they're going to be a friend at first, or they can do malicious things over time. I've had a lot of it good experience with having the villain show up do something terrible and leave because when every time they can't get their hands on them, they're going to hate that person more and more and more and more. So, uh, you know, it's same with, it, it, with, with every other aspect of a one shot, it's all condensed. You got to get out who the characters are faster. You got to get out who the conflict is faster. You got to get out and then resolve that faster. Um, but like, uh, I've done a, a couple of one shots for world builders, the charity, which is kind of in my home brewish world um, that I do in the way I introduced the, the it, it was a, they, they have a society that is all basically built around the worship of this dragon. Like they all live around a volcano. It's kind of like Minas Tirith from the Lord of the Rings where they've like all their civilizations on the outside of this volcano because the dragon's on the inside. And the way I set it up, was I had a flashback to when the dragon first originally arrived and they originally formed this relationship with the dragon. And so they knew immediately, like in the first 30 seconds, it was a cold open that it's like, oh, okay, that's what this is. And then midway through the episode, they kind of find out, they're like, wait a second, the dragon's an asshole. Oh no. <laughs> and so uh, and plant the seeds there, basically. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I think that's a really cool thing. And you yeah. can see that, uh, that, uh, that, show that uh the world builders uh episode is uh one shot is uh linked on canvas for this week we, we've done two of them we did two of them with the first group i think i've done two more that were just individual groups and they've asked me to do another one in december so we'll see oh, nice. maybe i can get back the first group no that's a, it's mm -hmm. a high quality group i mean most you i haven't seen you play with a dud player yet and i won't ask you mm -hmm. if there has been a dud player but yes <laughs> uh, and, uh, is there is there something that you do with a dud or do you just kind of let them or what is a dud player so if i have someone who is not performing at the table the very first thing i look at is what can i do to enable them because not everybody's going to jump out and grab the spotlight 
uh, not everybody is super quick on their feet and thinking. Sometimes people have to have a, a moment to plan and think about what they're going to do. Um, I try to always make sure that I give every single person a chance to shine um, in the, both from a technical standpoint, from a personal standpoint, in the sense that if you got a rogue, there needs to be somewhere in here where there's a stealth component or they get to disarm a trap or something or get to you know, sneak up and backstab somebody. Um, if you got somebody who is a fighter, who intelligence and charisma and wisdom are their dump stat and their you know, great weapon master or whatever, you got to give them a chance to hit something. You got the talky characters, give them a chance to be talky, you know, like, like sprinkle, sprinkle it around. Because at the end of the day, the reason why people play these games is it gives them a chance to feel like they're at cause in the narrative, that what they do or don't do matters um, in a way that we very rarely get in life and don't often get in video games where you, you play the hero, but there's still a fairly linear track of, of how that heroism manifests. Uh, TTRPGs don't have that. And we get to define ourselves. And oftentimes, especially newer players, you, when you look at some of the earliest characters a person playing, they're playing their idealized best self. Because what you'll learn, especially for those of you that are just starting out doing this, as you play a little while, you will start to find certain through lines in every character you make, because those through lines are you. And you learn yourself in that, that you're like, oh, this person is, why are they all chaos monkeys? That's weird. Hmm. You know, <laughs> um, because the real monkey was you all along. Um, so w once you become mindful of that, it gives you an insight in, into, you know, yourself that you can't get in other ways. And I mentioned, you know, I used to do Patreon games. I ran like 35, 40 games a month at the height of my Patreon, which was bananas. And I do not recommend I mean, I've run about 600 games of Vampire V5. I've run more games of Vampire than anyone alive. Uh, I, I, V5, at least. I, I would say I've, I've run more than anybody, period. But there's some cats that have probably had weekly games since V1. They've been doing it for 30 years. But V5, I got that one. And um, what, what I found was, and this, was an, this is another strength of the world of darkness, that because that world is so much closer to ours, the meaningful impact it can have on people is higher to the surface. You know, like the your bugbear paladin can die a glorious death, you know, where, where he repents for his, his having broken his oath. And, you know, that might be very compelling. It might be. But there's so many layers that you have to get into there. Whereas when this person is basically you, but just now happens to be a vampire, has all of your own frailties and things. And, and, and I, what I would see was I'd see people that showed up that were, you know, shy, that learned how to stand up for themselves, that were, by, by their own admission, you know, runners and very conflict avoidant, that learned how to face things, you know, that, that people that, you know, their instinct was to shoot first and, you know, had to learn to talk things out. And told me again and again and again how this translated into their real life you know that it's like i real i didn't i actually saw how i was doing the things my character was doing and now i don't have to anymore and i'm like yeah that's how it goes and that that's good. that's something that is a particular gift with longer form stuff <laughs> you can you can get there in shorter runs but it's much harder you know you kind of have to wear that mask for a while to be able to see it over time yeah i'm i'm amazed that you're getting that out of vampire i think in part because i grew up vampire was my first game and so i was surrounded by high school idiots so you know it, that, that is uh, kind of lingered but i think one of the other things that our students have been really interested in our conversations is these kinds of both official therapeutic Ver, uh, ways of using role playing, but these kinds of informal ways that storytelling can be growth oriented. And it sounds like, you know, given your very, you know, kind of jack of all trades skill set, you seem to play into that in different kinds of ways. Yeah. Um, the, you know, my friend, my friend, Dr. Janina Scarlett's doing some great work in that area. Um, Dr. Megan McConnell and everybody at Clinical Role, uh, Game to Grow. Um, all of those places are, are really having uh, a lot of success with using this as, as a therapeutic modality. Absolutely. But, yeah, but I mean, you know, it, again, oh, no, excuse me. Um, when, when 
I've been doing this long enough that when I make characters now, the, I'm I'm expressly trying to do something I haven't done. Like, you know, what what's a race I haven't played, a class I haven't played, a clan I haven't played. You know, just just and then once I have that, I will fill in who they are. But you know, with most people, when they make characters, it is giving you an insight into who they are, who they wish to be, and what they need. And that doesn't mean that, again, if you play the bugbear assassin, that you secretly wish to kill people. But it's like, but you want to be, you know, you want to be cool and powerful, you know, and be able to move unseen. The person who's always one step ahead, you know, things like that. If you're playing the the halfling bard that is just the sex pot, you know, that's still an insight, you know, and it's all valid. It's all valid. Yeah. Now I'm trying to think about what it means that I play gnomes a lot, but I'm just going to let that go for I mean, a minute. I'm not going to bust you out in front of your students, but I'll, 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 tell, you later. I'll tell you later. Um, <laughs> let, 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 me, let me tell you my gnome story real quick, because I, I, I know we're, we're approaching time here. I always hated the small folk. Again, I'm gigantic. So when people are like, uh, you know, I'm going to play a dwarf. I'm like, for what? I was already five foot. It was called the fourth grade. No, you know, um, it was, was, was never my thing. And when my oldest child was about two years old, no, she might not. She might have been more like 18 months. She could walk, but she couldn't really talk. So, you know, that time where they, they're ambulatory, but do not comprehend. No, she comes running out of the kitchen with a butcher knife. Just Whoa. running with a butcher knife. I to this day I have no idea how she got it. And so to her, she's happy. And I'm like, well, this is terrible. Uh I actually I actually hit her with the exact same like knife disarm I would have used on a grown man. Like, oh, okay, that's mine now. Great, thanks. All right, yay. And she just runs off happy again. And I remember distinctly thinking in that moment, I'm like, I get gnome rogues now. I get gnome rogues. Because if she'd come out and had two of them, like, let's go, I would have been like, uh. Mm. Yeah. So, and we then looking, uh, yeah, we were looking at the stats and realizing that um, our friends, two-year-old and our friends, like nine-year-old, are the different heights of the gnome, like the smallest gnome and the tallest gnome. And we're like, oh, they are really fucking small. You know, uh, well, what's funny is when I created Freely, who's my D and D character, yes. who's become my most popular. I created Freely to be not Victor. That that. <laughs> that victor is a planner and a tactician freely's happy-go-lucky and impulsive you know victor's kind of morally gray with his own code freely is unassailably good i'm physically big freely's gonna be little that is why he's a halfling and and he has created his own luck he's the first character i got into a video game all like uh, objectively he has manifested i've played that character in, in like seven streams more things have happened for my lucky boy than anybody else so yep yeah and we, well we're hoping that uh, at least i'm hoping that uh, some of that luck rubs off on uh, on victor uh whose whose fate is still unknown as of the time of this uh discussion la by night is coming to a conclusion I'm, I'm a, you know, again, I keep pulling out all my Ventrue swag over here. Like there's, there's, there's my ring, my Ventrue ring, you know, uh, it's all in the can and I'm just going to tell you, it's the end of the Chronicle. That's all I'm going to say. It's, it's all, so, um, so, it's without all done. Talking, so without talking about spoilers, because mm -hmm. I, I'm going to use my shameless kind of, I wrote a dissertation on um, expectations around endings. As a player, what's it like to kind of come to something where you know closure is coming, you don't know what it's going to look like in, in this particular genre, in this form? You know, it varies by stream and by story, but, you know, you, you can use, unless you've been expressly told otherwise, you can assume that on an ongoing show, you probably have a certain amount of plot armor. I mean, if, if you do something really stupid, so be it. If you sacrifice yourself or do something heroic, so be it. But chances are you're not just going to catch an arrow in a throat if, if, if it's a weekly ongoing thing. Um, not, that's not to say there weren't times that I was very, very scared that Victor's death was imminent many times over the course of this show. But I was like, I got this. I'm going to figure it out. Uh, I, I say being trapped down there with the werewolf was one. 
Uh, but I think the most afraid I ever was was when we were trapped down there with Strauss, uh, with Jasper and Eva and me, the whole mass dominate thing. That's what I was like. He will kill us all. What is wrong with you? So um, knowing... <laughs> Because you have, because it's broken up in, it's been broken up into five seasons. And so mm -hmm. how much did you know whether there was going to be pickup at the end of each of those experiences of filming? We pretty much always knew there'd be more. We just never knew when. And unfortunately, I think that was the thing that hamstrung us the most were our long layoffs, most of which we couldn't control. Uh, I, sure. I think, you know, the, the show started so big. If we'd been able to stay a little more consistent, I mean, we'd be gigantic now uh, because that is another thing about this medium. You have to give people an opportunity to make your content a habit, that what they do at this time is consume your thing. Um, but knowing it was ending meant n no one was safe. You know, like there was there was no guarantee that we had to come back at the end because there was no there was nothing to come back to next time. Um, so, I mean, I will be vague because not everyone has seen it and not everyone even watches the show, although you should because it is objectively incredible and not because of me, it's because of my cast. Um, when I knew there was really only two plots left to explore in the show, I knew there was the two eye and the sabbat. That was all we had left. So I figured one of those two things if, or both of those things were going to feature very heavily into the final season. And when things go where they go in the first episode, I none of us knew. None of us knew. And in fact, for the first five episodes, we were separated. And Jason asked us, not, don't come to the set and don't talk to each other about what happens. And I didn't. And some of my cast brothers and sisters were very much like, so what happened in your episode? I'm like, he told me not to tell you. And he's like, well, let me tell you what happened in mine. I'm like, I don't want to know. No. Like, <laughs> yeah. So as he, I... I'm, I have awareness of, of some things because of things that happen later in the season, of course, but like this episode that just, the episodes that are airing right now, I'm seeing for the first time, just like you are. Yeah, and one of the things I've been telling students is that because vampires are kind of always constructed on the idea that the world is a mystery to even some of the players, mm -hmm. that the last season is actually a good place to potentially jump in if you're interested in seeing how the world of darkness plays out. Um, it's also played, you guys film in person. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm wondering, I know you do a lot of content over Zoom, which makes, means you're available for things like this, but what's the distinction as we kind of come to this close about the difference between performing live in a studio versus on Zoom? Just aside from, you don't have to do the production stuff if you're in person. There, There's two major differences that is a, a benefit. Oh, hang on, choking on my water. <coughs> It's not the Rona, I promise. Um, there's, there's, there's two major strengths of each thing. All things being equal, you will get superior performances around a table. When you can see each other, you can feel each other's energy, you can feel the vibe, you're less likely to interrupt and step on each other. All of those things can happen, but all things being equal, you will get a better performance from people who are together. What the Heads and Boxes Renaissance has allowed, however, is to assemble casts that you never would have been able to assemble. I've, I mean, Black Dice Society, uh, you know, four of us are here in LA, but uh, we got people in Chicago, Canada, and Texas, you know, like we, we couldn't have this group for a weekly show around the table. Um, the same thing that we just did with this thing for celebration is Matthew Lillard, Alicia Marie, Todd Stashwick, Patrick Rothfuss, and, and um, Deborah Ann Wall. I couldn't get them all in the room unless maybe, you know, if we'd all happened to have been at celebration and the before times, uh, it just wasn't available. So the people you, cause you can get somebody to call in on a zoom substantially easier than you can get them to get in a car and drive across town. So mm -hmm. better performances live at a table, better casting options and groups you can form via zoom. Um, and that's been something that's been very of, of interest to me. It seems like, you know, I was uh, listening to Omega Jones talk about needing to make the move to LA because the work is there and things like that. It seems like uh, actual play started, you know, close to Wizards in Seattle and is now kind of really coalesced primarily around Los Angeles. Would uh -huh. you say that's true? And what's uh, yeah. been the appeal? 
It is it is true. Uh, I mean, Hyper RPG tried to launch in Seattle and ended up having to come back to L.A. Um, it is not that there's anything special about Los Angeles, except the fact that it is the center of the known universe. Um, <laughs> it, it's just you just have talented professional performers here because they're here anyway. You know, they were here because they were trying to be actors. Um, it's not that you can't assemble a murder squad in Alabama if you, you know, find the right people. It's just uh, the, the people that already have the skill set have already self-selected and were serious enough to be here. And mm -hmm. so much of this is relationships. So much of this is knowing people. Um, it is not just who you know, but what they know you for. Um, you know, they have to know you as a solid, reliable person. Again, the project that I just said, the, the TV project yesterday, uh, I was like, I can suggest five people. I know hundreds. I know everybody in this space. And I'm all like, let me tell you who you should get. This person, this person, this person, this person. And they're like, what about this person? I'm like, no. You know? Uh, and so that's 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 it because i what i can tell you in this space it is not about resumes i can't tell you how many times i watch this exact exchange where it's like we need a new cameraman mm, why don't you call doug doug uh really yeah i had a bad experience with doug what about susan susan's dope cool we'll call susan that's it <laughs> that's it <laughs> no application no interview <laughs> no, just it's it's you mean done. hiring doesn't take a year and a half and like 11 million hours of hr work oh it's weird i know it's bizarre we also uh, don't get tenure though <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh, that's there's there's a reason why there are actors in our theater department uh, but uh so do you find that that folks in in this space are thinking about this as something that they're doing as gigs in relationship to other work in film and TV that they're actually, you know, kind of gunning for or writers, or is it a combination? Is there, you know, a quintessential streamer, uh, actual player profile at this moment? Um, it's a little of both. To tell you the truth, most of the people that are making real moves in this space are just lifetime geeks that got really lucky like me. Um, and you happen to be in the right place, the right time and know the right friend and got brought in kind of in on the ground floor, you know, your, your Amy Dolan's and your Hector Navarro's of the world. Um, I don't, uh, I, I could be wrong, but in my experience with them, you know, neither of them aspires to, you know, to, to be Academy Award winning performers, you know, they, they just love yeah. these things. Um, and, you know, in exist in these spaces. Um, then the second group to that is the people who very much want to still be um, mainstream performers. Um, you know, again, I, I, I do film and television and hopefully have mainstream acting roles coming up. But for me, I came into this just absolutely backwards. Uh, like I said, I didn't want to be a writer, but I haven't had any acting training. I wasn't a theater kid. I just I started doing it and it so happened I was pretty good at it and I liked it. And I was like, well, okay. I didn't even refer to myself as an actor for a very long time because I was like, this isn't what I went to school for. You know, I'm not constantly going out on auditions. You know, it's not just like my, my heart and soul. And then I booked enough gigs that I was like, nah, I'm, I'm, I, think, <laughs> I think this counts. I think this counts. So, yeah. It's but, nice to know imposter syndrome is everywhere in some way, shape, or form. Yes. You know what's funny? If you just said that, I was going to say I never feel like I suffer from imposter syndrome ever because I know how hard I work. But, I mean, I guess that's the closest I've ever gotten. I guess. I guess. I will concede that, Dr. Friedman. Thank you. I guess. Thank you. I guess. Well, there are a highly specialized imposter syndrome that has largely it seems like been erased by the fact that you just kept doing the work and kept showing up and it seems like that's the starting place for a lot of this stuff is you find something that you're interested in and start doing it and you might suck at it or you might not but if you show up and you do the work yep you're hard into it and show that you're consistent seems like that's the the recipe you're suggesting yeah, and, you know, understand that success is by no means guaranteed. Uh, a lot of it is luck. It really is. But, you know, what I tell people, if you're going to you're going to hit one out of every hundred shots you take, 
so compensate by taking 10,000 shots. I mean, the more energy and effort you put into the universe, the more likely something is to come back and work out for you. All you can do is control your actions and your own mindset and, you know, tr trust in uh, whatever you believe in, in, in God, in the universe, in your fellow human beings, uh, in R and Jesus, and just random fate and chance that, you know, your day will come. Just keep moving forward. Yeah. Final questions from the room. Anything else bubbling up as we get to the end of our conversation? Delta, you got anything? Not really. I, I don't even know what you guys are talking about. Reverse oh, class, well, well, luckily, this has been recorded. It will be on Canvas, so you can catch up. And of course, you can always um, if you have kind of specialized questions, Fide's DMs are open um, on Twitter, and I would encourage you to take use of that and shamelessly name drop me to the extent that that helps anything. Um, I think you're generous just across the board. Um, it's kind of been amazing to uh, oh, let me see. I see a note in chat from from one of our students who's uh, remote. This has been, you know, my students know that last week I was um, kind of just sitting in this room and my students were saying, Dr. Freeman, how did this happen? And the answer is like the kind of generosity of folks in this space, I think for a variety of reasons. I'm curious, just as a final question is, what led you to offer to come to our class? I know you've done other classes, but you know, what, what sparked the, what did the inspiring? I mean, I'm, I myself love teaching uh, and, and I love talking about the things I enjoy as much as I love doing the things I enjoy, but I just really wanted to have the opportunity to impress upon all of you that I realize it is a challenging time right now. It is, you know, the, there's the pandemic, you know, the, the climate change, uh, politics, like the, there's some heavy stuff that you guys are going to have to deal with as, as you were making your way out into this world. But believe it or not, this is the greatest time in history to be alive. Nobody has ever had it easier than we've got it. For all of our challenges, uh, every it has been substantially worse in the past with a lot less resources. And the number one thing you all have going for you that most of us didn't have before is you can 100% define yourself and define your life. You don't have to live your parents' life and their expectations, not people from your church, not people from your town. You can literally be, do, or have anything. I've done so much in this world and I've been so fortunate and I'm doing so much more and the sky is absolutely the limit. And I just wanted to tell you that you guys can take this and what you've learned here and go anywhere and do anything. You are literally unstoppable. Only thing that can stop you is the person in the mirror. So most of the students in this room are seniors who are gonna be graduating. I'm gonna to venture to say this may have been a better, uh, this, your, those final statements may have been a better uh, commencement address than the one they might get in the arena. So thank you so much. It's true. And, uh, Hope, hopefully I, I, they don't send somebody garbage. <laughs> I mean it though, serious. And even if, if, if after this, if you're out in the world and you're, you're, you just, you know, not sure what your next move should be. I've meant when I said my DMs are open, holler at me anytime. It's such a, it's such a pleasure to have, to be in this space now too. I think five years ago, if you told me I would be researching actual play <clears throat> and TTRPGs, I would have said, I'm an 18th centuryist, uh, but here we are, and here we are kind of in this you know, interdisciplinary space as colleagues, and it's been just such a wonderful chance to get to talk to you and have our students listen. So let's all thank Vide Walters for being our